Okay, thank you all for coming. Thank you for joining our senior parent college timeline. Um, this is basically just the nuts and bolts of what to expect for your um, for your senior um, and also for yourself when it comes to the transition of you know starting of the senior year, um, you know college applications um, like test scores and things like that, and then how to um, how to handle it all. So basically that's um, that's it. And then any other information um, we will provide for you later. But we will be having some more um, senior parent um, college things that will be happening um, later on in the school year. So first off, um, congratulations, especially when it comes to you and your senior um, for making it. Um, we're all very proud of them for how far um, they've gotten. And so, and congratulations to you for helping them um, get this far. Uh, first off, I want to um, talk about the meeting norms um, of this uh, session. Um, we want to have people ask questions and be very active. We would like you to um, ask your questions in the chat in order to continue the, um, the flow of the conversation. So just ask your questions um, in the chat. Try to keep it as, um, as general as possible with um, leaving out any specifics about your own um, child. Like, so things that would be, that would be helpful to like the whole um, uh, senior student population or parent population. Um, if you could leave your uh, microphone on mute um, for, you know, for when you're, you're not speaking. I believe we put on the thing where um, everybody comes in with, um, with the mute on, but if you, after, after you're done speaking, if you could go ahead and um, mute yourself again. And then also just know to like, if you could uh, not disclose any personal information about your child um, in the chat. So first, we want to acknowledge that this is um, possibly um, an emotional year. This might be your first child that's going off to college, so it's about to graduate, and all the um, all the feelings that come from this. Or this might be your second, third, fifth. You know what I mean? Student um, who's a child who's doing that. Um, we want to acknowledge that um, all the feelings are valid, even if it's like the first, second, or third, um, and what those feelings um, and the emotions that may come from your child being um, in its senior year. Um, we do have a um, like a transitions uh, meeting or transitions um, session with the high school counselors. That's me and Miss Lisa and Miss Catherine um, Cherry. And we talk about the transitions of the things that, um, that we need to do for ourselves, for our, um, for our, our for our child and for our family when it comes to transitioning through like this year. And also at the end of the school year, we have like a wrap up of the same thing um, of, you know, transitions when it comes to your child leaving. So it's a lot of great stuff about things that need to happen before, you know, the real waterworks and emotions really um, start to pick up. So if you would like to join us, we have um, one coming up uh, on Tuesday, September the 13th from 8.30 to 9.30 in the Innovation Center. I believe that there will be a sign-up sheet that will be going, um, that will be going out. Um, also, the PTO will be coming in. Um, the PTO will be coming in for about five minutes in the beginning, um, asking if you would be interested in joining, um, joining them for, I guess, like senior event planning or something like that, and then getting um, the senior parents involved in that. So they'll be coming for that. Okay, so I um, just wanna let you know that um, the counselors are here to help you. Um, if you're dealing with issues when it comes to college prep, or you have any questions about that, you're confused about certain things when it comes to like uh, different countries or anything, Please, please come and ask us. Um, ask us questions. We are definitely here to um, support you. Um, just know that we're also really, really active. We we are constantly having meetings um, with with our um, with our students. We're constantly having like little workshops, um, seminars, and stuff like that through um, with our students throughout the year. Um, your your students or your seniors um, had pretty much the exact same conversation with them. 
earlier this week about what to expect for um, for this year. So please, please um, reach out to us with any any questions on the senior process and especially college apps. So. Lisa, you can go ahead. So we met with those seniors on Monday um, and went over just kind of getting their head back in the game, right? Reminding them of deadlines, reminding them of things coming up this year related to college, the things that we had started working with them on last year. And these were some of the things that we talked to them about. One is that we've asked them to meet with us um, before September 30th. We just need an update from, from the summer, from conversations you guys have had at home, um, and to kind of know what their plan and what their thinking is right now. We've also asked them to add colleges to their Maya Learning Considering list. Um, last year, we sent information out about the new Maya Learning Program. It's our platform for college admissions. It's how we'll send documents to schools and things like that you should have that login. If you're stuck with that, we can tell you real quickly how to get into it. Um, but students are able to add universities to their considering list. And those are the ones that they, um, doesn't mean they're gonna apply, but they're in the running right now. Things they're really think universities are really thinking about. We ask them to continue to research college deadlines and application requirements. That's gonna be critical. Deadlines will start as early as October 15th this fall and then go into March and April as well. So depending on the country and system and the type of application that you're doing, um, it will depend on, on your deadlines and the application. So we've asked them to continue to research and to find a, um, a a way to track that information, a way to organize it. So whether it's a Google spreadsheet or whatever, we've kind of shown them some samples of those as well. Um, we've said that if you're going to make an EA, which is early action or an ED, early decision deadline in the US, that you really do need to make those decisions soon because you've got quite a bit of, of work to do to prepare that application, whether it's finalizing essays, getting the actual application completed online, um, so those decisions need to be made soon. Am I going to do an ED? Am I not? As a really quick reminder, um, early decision ED is a binding agreement. You can only apply to one school ED. EA, early application, is not binding, and you can apply to as many EA schools as you might like. I think we talked through a lot of that last year, and especially when we had our meetings with you and, and your students, um, but please reach out anytime if you want some clarification on some of those things with the U.S. And then we also reminded them to please take advantage of college events online to... Um, we have some reps actually coming to campus this year. Travel's beginning to start up again. It's not huge, but it's beginning. And there's quite a few virtual fairs and individual visit schools that just want to talk with students um, online like we're doing tonight through a Zoom. So we want them to continue to research, look, learn about schools. You never know. The school that turns out to be perfect for them, they may learn about this fall. So again, just to keep on um, researching and taking advantage of those opportunities as they come. Let me go back here. Um, in your Maya Learning, so in your Maya Learning account, you guys would access it as parents by going to www.maya.learning.com. You click sign on with Google, and then you choose whichever email you gave ISD. That's the email we signed you up with. So if you click on sign in with Google, choose the email that you've given to ISD, um, that will get you into your parent account and you can see all of this information. One of the things that you can see is this university visits calendar. So if you notice over here on the left um, sidebar, you've got one called events, you click on that and you get this university visits that are updated continually. So you can look in to see what's coming up, um, things that you may wanna participate in as a parent if you have the time, ones you want your students to participate in, um, they're all right here in the Maya Learning platform. One of the big ones that we've highlighted to the students and we wanna encourage you as well because this is open to parents, is University Exploration Day Africa. The date that this is on is Tuesday, September 20th, which happens to be a school holiday. We had planned on having the students together at school um, and participating in this together with each other and with us. 
And it just turned out that we don't have a school that day for students. They have off both Monday and Tuesday, the 19th and 20th. So we are still encouraging them greatly to participate. It was a fantastic event for our seniors last year as they learned more about schools and programs and majors. And we would encourage you as parents to do that as well. The link to register is there. And I believe tomorrow you're gonna to receive an email with more information about this and the links for it. But again, just to be aware, there are some kind of big fairs that are coming up soon. Okay, so we've told the students what their first tasks are, and now we're gonna give you some. Please begin talking with your child about prospective colleges and developing a timeline. Begin the college conversation. Um, what are some factors that are most important for you as parents? You may find that what's important for you is equally as important to your child, or you may find that they vary quite a bit. So having conversations just to bring it together is really helpful. What are your factors in deciding? Is it location? Is it being near family? Is it cost? Is it program? Um, is it potentially family moves and decisions that are gonna happen in the following year? What are those things that are in your head as you look at colleges for your child? Um, what's going to be a good fit for your child? Where will they thrive and do their best work? So just continue to um, keep those in mind and talk about it. I think the more open and transparent you are and your children will be with you, the better the whole decision-making process will go. So begin talking about it. Um, equally important is figuring out how much or how little to talk about college at home. If students feel like the only thing you wanna talk about is college and applications, they will not talk to you. We have that from experience, right? It's just, they get really tired of it and they just will stop and they'll shut down. So think about for your own child, is it something where maybe you wanna have like a Sunday afternoon time and you sit together and talk about how things are and do an update? Do you wanna go out for coffee or brunch or lunch and do it once a week? Is it a couple of evenings? Um, it's up to you as a family and what really works for you, but we just have learned over the years that if you talk about it too much, you'll get less and less information. So just something to think about. Um, talk with your child about joining their senior meeting. We have asked them all to meet with us again um, before the end of September, and you are very welcome to join that meeting. We've told the students it's up to them. They can invite you or not, but you can also ask them to invite you. Um, and those can be virtually or in person. Whatever works best for your timing and your schedule, we're happy to accommodate that. Um, and then last, we're going to ask you to complete the parent brag sheet by the end of September. And this will be coming out to you, I think, before the weekend. But this is your opportunity to tell us from your perspective how amazingly awesome your kids are. The more we hear about that, the better. One of the jobs that we will have um, and one of the best parts of our job is getting to really brag on your students to support them and write these really wonderful letters about the great people that they are. Um, and we do that best when we have more and more information. So anecdotes that you have, just the amazing things you've seen your children do, we wanna know as well. So please, um, it may take you a little time to do it, but we really ask that you do that. It'll be an important part of our ability to, <clears throat> to support them in their applications. Testing. So bottom line, for the UK and Europe, and for most of Canada, if a student is completing the full IB diploma, that's all you need. If a student is not completing the full IB diploma, there may be some other criteria that um, you might need to send and a school might ask for an SAT score. But in general, SATs are more in the US and less and less universities are requiring them. When we went through the period with COVID, universities had to stop requiring the SAT as a, as a measure or as part of the application because students simply weren't able to gather in buildings and take the test. So universities went test optional and most have stayed test optional through this application cycle we're beginning right now. So for US universities, there are only a few that still want an SAT. It's clearly on their website. It's the question everyone's asking. You also can look at this list, um, the first bullet point, fairtest.org. That gives you a list of every university that says they are test optional. 
So if you want to look and see if, if the SAT and testing is maybe a factor in which schools go on the list, you may want to look at that list and just see um, what's required. If a student decides they want to take the SAT, there's two testing dates this fall. The first one is October 1st, and the registration deadline is this Friday. So the students know that, we've shared that with them, but you may want to encourage if they want to take that October test. If they want to take it in December, you've got until November 3rd to register. So those are the two upcoming SAT tests this fall. I will say that the SAT is changing in the spring. It's going into a digital format. It'll be truly completely different than it is now. I would not encourage our current seniors, your children, to take any testing in the spring because you'll be prepping for an entirely different test. If there's a certain scenario or situation and you think the spring is the best time, please talk to either Yo or myself um, so we can just kind of help talk you through that because it really will be a very different test than what they may have practiced for so far. Um, but there are two tests this fall. Um, sending official test scores to colleges, those should go in about three weeks before the actual application deadline. Test scores belong to the student. So whether it's a TOEFL or an IELTS or an SAT, um, those belong to the student and the student must contact the testing agency and have that agency send them to universities. So just something to be aware of. We can't send them as, as the school, they have to come from the testing agency. And then the TOEFL or IELTS are the tests of English. And for most of our students that are doing English A in the IB, they do not need a TOEFL or IELTS score. Um, it's really unusual for a school to ask for that once they see the level of the coursework they're doing. However, even last year, we had a few schools that said, oh, we see that you have a seven in English A higher level, we still want a TOEFL. Um, and in that case, we can help you contact TOEFL or IELTS and set up a testing time. There are more test dates and times with those tests than with something like the SAT. So you, you don't have to sign up so early and there's many more than say just to a semester like there is with SAT. So that can be a conversation a little bit later on down the road, but just be aware that there could be some schools that, that may want um, to see an English language proficiency test. Applications, something else for students to um, be thinking about and one of the things you might help them with, there are many ways that you apply to a university. And I've listed just a few of them on the screen right here. So one is the common application. You may have heard of that. Quite a few of our students will be applying to universities that use what's called the common application or common app. There's over 900 universities on it and 60 of those are outside of the US. So a lot of, of universities will use the Common App and we will work with the students on setting up those accounts and starting that. Um, if they're applying to the UK, they're gonna use UCAS as a system. And again, we'll meet with them and talk them through getting UCAS set up and ready to go. For students looking to apply to the University of California or Cal State, that's a different system for all of those schools. Apply Texas for any of the universities in Texas. Ontario University Application Center is for any of the universities in, Toronto, in Ontario, including Toronto and the towns around. So um, we often have applications up in the Toronto area. Students applying to the Netherlands, we use StudiLink. And then some schools just ask you to apply directly through their website. So it will be important to know for each school that you are applying to, which um, which application format you'll be using. It's just an important thing to kind of understand. We have the application notification form. It's in orange because it's a, an ISD required form. And that's the form that our students fill out to tell us that they are going to, to not only consider the university, they are definitely going to apply there. So we're asking them for how they apply, what the deadline is they're applying for, and all of those kind of things. And then we use that form to track our own work and to make sure that we have documents sent on time to the university. Um, and then the last kind of big part of the applications and forms would be just the financial aid documents. So if you're applying for financial aid or for scholarship applications, those kinds of things, there will be some more forms that are associated with that. Okay, so I know that was quite a bit, wasn't it? Um, there will be some paperwork associated with the process. So let me give you just some deadline, general deadlines for U.S. colleges. <clears throat> 
The earliest would be October 15th, and there are a few universities that will have that. Um, Georgia Tech is an October 15th for early or early action. Um, and there's one more that I can't think of off the top of my head, I'm sorry, but that could be one. So that's one of the reasons you want to make sure that you know the schools you're applying to and those deadlines. Um, I was talking with a senior today and we said, you know, hey, tomorrow is September, right? And that just makes October feel that much closer. So just kind of thinking about getting those dates in your head and how what work needs to be done between now and then. November is the other big timeline deadline for um, early decision. Typically November 1st or November 15th, schools will use as their early decision or early action deadline. So ED or EA. University of California schools, it's always a November 30 deadline. So everything by November 30. December 1st, there'll be some early deadlines for that and often scholarship deadlines at US universities. If it's a scholarship you're applying for, those can often be December 1 as well. Um, and then in January, typically January 1st or that first, the first few days in January will be the regular deadline for a lot of the US schools. But again, please make sure you check each individual school's deadlines. Universities meet in the summer and they can change their entire process if they want to. And they often make some tweaks um, that we don't know about until we're in the middle of it. So we encourage you to really check those individual schools. General deadlines for non-US schools. In the UK, if you are applying for any program at Oxford, Cambridge, and for almost all the courses in medicine and dentistry and vet medicine, it's an October 15th deadline. The regular deadline for the UK this year will be January 25. In the Netherlands, it's usually spring deadlines. Um, it goes into March. However, if students are applying for a very selective program in the Netherlands, they often call them numerous fixes. Those deadlines are January 15. So it's again, after the first of the year, but still pretty early. Canada, the application deadlines do vary by school, but they're usually into late January, February. In Canada, the first semester grades for seniors is really important. Canadian schools like to see how students have done this first semester in their grades. And then other places in the world, Australia, other countries in Europe, Korea, and Japan typically have spring deadlines, meaning late February, March, um, or even later, depending on programs. So just an idea to kind of get, get your head around the timing of certain things and when they'll be due. I would say for families that are anticipating maybe earlier deadlines, I believe the key to keep in mind is will you, will the student present themselves in the best light possible as early, um, early in the process. So when a student submits an application to college, they want it to represent their best self. And so that means the best essays are written, proof, draft, they're, they're perfect. Um, it means that any testing required is done, that their grades are really where they need to be. They're happy with their predicted IB scores. Everything's really where it should be. That's when you're ready to apply. If you need first semester to really get things where they need to be and to submit your best self on paper, then I would say it's better to wait um, for a later application. But just some things to think in mind as you're speaking and having these conversations at home as well. Financial aid. Um, it can include a lot of different things and also can be dependent on if your child is going to university in your passport country. Generally, financial aid comes in three types, and that's scholarships, which is money you don't pay back, loans, which is money you do have to pay back, and work study, which would be students who are working typically on a campus and earning money, but that money goes back in toward their tuition or their housing costs or things like that. Merit scholarships is where you'll find the biggest money, and that's money that comes directly from the university and is given for special talents or skills that they want on their campus. So they're really trying to entice the student to come by giving them a really large scholarship. So it could be that it's an athletic scholarship. It could be because of work they've done. Um, it can be diversity related. There's often schools that will give large scholarships because they're trying to diversify their population and they want students from certain um, parts of the world um, it can be special talents they have. It can be really students with super strong grades. 
um, as shown through their academic record and their transcript. So that's your merit scholarships. Universities will have some specific scholarships. Typically, you're going to find those most in the US. There's a handful at the most in Canada for university scholarships. And Europe does not have as many. I think when we've talked to the European schools, they've said that you know their tuition is quite a bit less and they really don't, um, they don't feel like scholarships are as important. Um, so it really will depend on where you're applying. If you are a US citizen and you do want to apply for any type of, of assistance, you do have to go through FAFSA, F-A-F-S-A, and the website is, is there on the screen. We can send this PowerPoint to you guys later this week and let you have all these slides so you've got links as well, if that's helpful. Um, one other thing to talk about that we kind of tried to bring up last year a bit is, does your child need to do military service um, or do they want to take a gap year? Sometimes a gap year is important because of things that have gone on. It could be family situations. You've moved around a lot. It's time to just take a, a rest in a year and not have another you know, new start somewhere. Um, there is required military service, and that's certainly something that um, our, ki our kids look at and need to do. But just know that um, that will impact the timing of their actual applications. There are some schools in the US that will defer admission. In other words, they would apply this year. If they're admitted, then they would ask the university to defer the admission for another year while a student does military service or takes a gap year. But outside of the US, it's really quite rare that universities will defer. Some US universities are not deferring as much as they used to simply because with COVID and the mix up with online classes and student numbers, they've really been a little crazy for the universities the past year or so. Um, universities are not as flexible with their deferment as they used to be. So just something else to keep in mind if your child may look at a, a different start date. What I also want you to know is that we ask our students who are not going directly into a um, further study after high school, we ask them to still follow the college process with us. We want them to get their teacher recommendations so we have those ready to go when it's time. We ask them to write essays with us. We ask them to just follow along with everything that we do because typically when they're ready to apply to university a year or so later, they're doing it alone. And there's something about having the comfort of all your peers doing it together, you're in it as a group. And so if, if they don't do anything this year and then wait a year to do all the work, they're gonna feel really alone and they're not gonna have as much support simply because they're not here with us where they can meet with us every day to go over some things. So um, just to keep that in mind and to know that we do ask them to continue to work with us on the same timeline that we're um, talking with, with everybody. And I just lost, there it is, sorry. Oh, so we're to questions. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and we'll go to the chat and look at what's in our chat right now. You already answered with the, um, you're gonna share the slides, you wanna share the video. So um, something to add on what um, Ms. Lisa Ball just said about the um, CIS Africa Fair. Um, last year when, I, when our seniors attended, I feel like that was the thing that kind of jump-started um, our group of seniors. Um, I don't think that they knew the amount um, of schools that would be there and the fact that they would actually be able to talk to the college reps. I mean, they were the college reps were really, really interested um, in speaking to them. They emailed them afterwards. Um, they got a lot of information. And some kids who thought that they were just going to, like, maybe go to the UK or stay in the US, all of a sudden were just like, the Netherlands, this is it. And, and they were knowing about pricing, and the, but it really, really activated our kids. Um, the only thing about the fair this year is that it lands on a professional development day for us. So our students are not going to be in school where typically we would take them out. We would have them be in the pack. And so they can have like the time and space to do it. But because we um, are having a PD day, that means that they're going to be at home. We uh, strongly encourage them to do it, to, even if they are at home, because it was a great, great um, uh, motivator um, from becoming passive to, um, to active participants in the college um, planning. 
We'll take another minute. I know we went through that pretty quick and just see if you do have some more questions, please feel free to um, write them in the chat and we'll kind of address them as, as they come in. If there's something else you want information on, Part of our, our desire tonight was just to kind of get you back into thinking about college and having those conversations and, and being supportive at home um, of what all is, is going on. It's, it's almost like adding another class into your schedule when you're trying to write essays into your college applications. Um, so someone is asking, my daughter is applying to a Texas college that is listed on the Common App. Does she need to apply through Apply Texas as well? No, most of the um, most of the public Texas schools are on Applied Texas, but if it's another school in Texas and it's on the Common App, you only have to apply through one method. So I would say in that case, if there's more schools, other schools that she's using on the Common App, I would just do the Common App to kind of minimize it and not make it more complicated. Um, but we're happy to talk individually about that as well. When should students expect to receive IB predicted grades? There is an official date set. I don't have it off the top of my head, but it's usually around the middle of November. So we'll get the first round of, of predicted grades will be early to mid November. And for students, and we've said this to them as well, if they have applications prior to that, we will go to the individual teachers and get their predicted grades sooner. Um, so you don't have to worry about that. We just need to make sure they're keeping us in the loop so that we have time to do that. Also, we are partnered with a program called Me Too, and that connects um, students with universities. So um, our students will put in their information um, about who they are, what they're interested in, stuff like that. And then universities will take the information and then contact them. Um, typically they will have a, they would ask a student to uh, have like a Zoom meeting to talk about their school and stuff like that. Those are really, really amazing because a lot of the students have, um, they were never thinking about going to Manitoba or they were never thinking about going to like um, schools in Michigan. And then all of a sudden they have like this interview with them and they're like, this is the school. Typically they went somewhere else, but the thing is it was like, it was a great, um, it was a great experience for them to like, kind of like branch out and, um, and talk to other schools. There's one question that's come in. Do you have links to housing and boarding options for students that are non-US citizens? It, are you looking at housing and boarding in the United States or in other countries? Because housing is pretty specific to the university and the country. So for the most part, US universities will have dorms and they there's a housing office that can help you there. Um, whether you're a citizen or not, it doesn't matter. Um, in places where, let's say in the Netherlands, they're, okay, housing in the US, thank you. <laughs> um, that'll come through the university. And so they will, there'll be an entire housing section on each of the university websites. Just know that typically uh, freshmen are expected to live in the dorms, unless like you have like a uh, genuine circumstance. But typically, freshmen or first-year college students, freshmen are expected to uh, live in the dorms or student housing. Something else just for you to know as well, we are continuing to meet with the seniors this year, not as often as we did with them last year as juniors. I think we had six or seven full blocks with them last year, just going over the various parts of the application process. But this year we already have time scheduled to spend time on their essays, um, to talk with each one about getting different applications started, UK, Common App, all of those things. So we'll continue to meet with them and our office doors are always open um, to both you and to them. Thank you. 
So we have a question. Is it the parent's responsibility to help the student through the application process online or the teachers? Most of the time students are applying online and they're doing it at home. The teachers will write the recommendation letters for students. They send them to us and we will send them on to the, um, to the, to the university. But in terms of the actual application process and filling that out, it would be typically you as parents kind of overseeing that. If there's a question or there's a glitch or you need some help with something, we're more than happy to, to work with you on that and to try to answer that. Um, but typically that is one of the parent responsibilities. Okay, we have a question about GPA. So as you know, we are um, an IB school. Um, your, your students are in the DP program. So we do not have a GPA, we have the IB scores. Now there's no real equivalent from the IB to, um, to the GPA. However, some schools are like, we absolutely need it. <laughs> so um, we have figured out some type of like rubric in order to figure out what the GPA would kind of look like. However, when um, giving this uh, GPA to the schools, we do let them know that, again, there is no equivalent, so there is a possibility of, it, of us over, overscoring or underscoring. Um, and we also um, give the rubric of the, of the IB scoring so that they have a good idea of what is like, you know, exceptional, what is like passing and what is not um, exceptional. So we give them all of that information. So um, that happened probably at least three or four times. So I had three or four students last year with the same exact um, situation. All of the schools that they applied to, one, they got in and two, that they accepted it. So um, it's a common thing that happens. So GPA um, shouldn't be an issue. We work well with schools with that. It's true. Um, explain the visa process for non-US students. Is it handled by the school, university, or individual? It basically is handled by the family, but with supporting documents from the university. So every if you're attending university in any country that you're not a citizen, students will need some kind of a study visa or a student visa. So let me just talk a little bit more about the US because I know the names of their forms better. When a student is admitted to a US university and they've paid a deposit to attend, signaling to the university that they intend to study there, the US university will send to the student a form called an I-20. The I-20 form is then taken to the embassy of the country. So let's say that your, your passport is Senegal, you're gonna study in the US. Um, once the university sends you the I-20, you take that passport copies, those kind of things to the US embassy, you make an appointment and then they interview you and they're the ones that would grant that study visa. There's often times, um, the visa is often may only start 30 days before the start of a university. Um, they will, you know, it, they have to renew it in a timely manner, but the US universities especially track that really closely there in the system. And so they'll work with them as well once they're on campus and remind them of the updates they need. But that is something where the university sends you the paperwork saying, yes, we've admitted the student, we want them to come. And then it's up to the embassy or that government to grant the study visa. I've also heard that um, the Netherlands does a lot of help um, gives a lot of support to students when it comes to um, um, getting visas. Graduation day. I was actually looking at that today on the calendar, looking for it. I have not seen it either, to be perfectly honest with you. I think it'll be out soon. If anyone on this call knows, that would be great. It's been the last Friday in May, and if it stays that way, that's May 26th, but I have not seen that published either. So um, give us some time and we'll get that out. Maybe we'll know it by the September 13th meeting when the PTO talks, because one of the things I know they want to talk about are some really cool, fun, special events that parents can help with to um, just celebrate the seniors. So we'll try and have more of that then.
Um, looks like May 26th. May 26th is graduation. May 26th. All right, graduation will be Friday, May 26th. Confirmed. Closer to graduation, um, closer to that senior week that's a special time and after all of their IB exams are finished and they're done with all of that, um, Yo and I will also meet with them and do some more transition to college kind of things, conversations about university campuses and what to expect and just kind of um, helping them to think through some of the new social atmosphere and those kind of things that go on on the campus as well. Um, in the past, during advisory, the advisors have also done some practical skills with the kids. It's always been fun, whether it's ironing or cooking or, um, you know, just different things, how to sew on a button, it's just kind of life skills. And so I imagine that will happen this year as well. We don't want to keep you longer. We are happy to stay on for a bit if you have some more questions. But if this is your dinner time and you need to go and take care of family and have dinner or do some other things, we certainly understand. Thank you all very much for coming tonight. Thank you.